Here we are at Talat Tongguin. This is south of Chiang Mai. It's a market known for having wild game and fresh things from the jungle. We've got bamboo worms, fried silkworms, crispy fried water bugs, fried crickets, grasshoppers, and of course, more bamboo worms. This is Nam Prik Num. It's ground up fresh green chili pepper with garlic, sometimes with eggplant and spices. It's very spicy, very savory, very popular dish in Northern Thailand. You usually eat it with um, fried pork crisps and the fried pork crisps are made right here. There's a huge pile of them here. There's a couple of different kinds, the stringy ones and the big ones, they're all delicious. General products here include fresh foods from all areas. This is fermented sausage here called nam, and it's raw pork fermented with some spices, and that's the way you eat it with a chili pepper. And some pork crisp, you've got eggs on a stick, some eggplants, this is saiua sausage on the right. We've got beef jerky, various types of chili, this is wild boar. The meat is so fresh, it's just bright red. Jungle fowl, hey, who knows what kind of birds you find in the jungle, but there they are. These are bee larvae. The flies are sometimes a little bit of a problem, but they, they really don't eat very much. Back to the wild pig again, you can see the bristles and the fresh meat. This market's full of fresh game. All right, they even eat the pig's head. They also put it out to show that the meat's fresh, but this one's just for show. Gross, what does terroir mean? Le goût du terroir, does this wine taste from where it's from? It's a word, but it's more of a concept from the French. And there's three major components that go into this concept of terroir. Grape variety, soil, and climate. And when you put all those three components together, you come up with terroir. When people talk about terroir in a wine, what they're talking about is does this wine reflect where it's from? It's very conducive to natural winemaking. If the winemaker will let the wine make itself and just guide it along, and especially if you have very uh, transparent grapes, like Pinot Noir Riesling, that lets you know where they're from. Terroir is really site-specific or regional-specific. Or another great analogy to use is Jersey tomatoes. You're not getting Jersey tomatoes, but anywhere from Jersey. Or oysters. Oysters off of Long Island are going to taste different than oysters from the Pacific Northwest based on the waters they're from. They reflect terroir wonderfully. I hope you learned something today. This is John Grossweiler. Always be passionate, never pretentious. You know, I often think that I have to be like the world's Riesling disciple. There are a lot of people out there who already know it. You love Riesling? I do. you have any thoughts about German Riesling? I'm a fan. I, Riesling is really one of the great wine grapes of the world. That's much closer to uh, yes. French and Italian sort of white. They normally like to drink whites from the Loire and whites from Bordeaux. And they're not so used to drinking Riesling. It's very bon. It's delicious. It's excellent. Excellent. Delicious. <laughs> Hi, I'm Philippe Nolan with Devour TV's Top 50 Dishes, and today we're in Noho at the very romantic Il Buco, where Cavolo Nero, the black kale salad, is the dish to order. And we just might eat it with our fingers. Alright, let's see if Philip is gonna like it. If not, he's gonna get choked by the chef. So let's check it out. Alright. Alright, chef. Kale. Ignacio, kale. Que bueno. This looks amazing. Uh, the secret is that the kale is fresh. You have to be really fresh. They always start turning bitter. So you have the black kale, which is raw, mm -hmm. then the croutons the Parmesan cheese, yeah. and in the dressing you see little pieces of anchovy. And little pieces of uh, garlic as well. And then the vinaigrette seems to have something else in there also. We have lemon, we have a red wine vinegar, garlic, and we have some raw egg in it. 
and I understand that this is going to be a bit chewy. This one is a, a, a tiny bit, but I like the, the texture of it. You know, I, it's like your bite and it's like a, you're like a cow, you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> so, it feels it feels nice, nice and grassy. Chef, salut, salut. Let's give it a try. The black kale salad at Il Buco. I can feel that this is a a strong leaf. It's not a wimpy little yeah. whatever. Mm. This is so good. What I like about it is you can taste how green this leaf is, no? Yeah. There's like a depth, there's almost an earthiness to the leaf. I mean, it's full of flavor right up front with this wonderful dressing. But the thing that really strikes me is the texture. Is it okay if I do it with my fingers? Go with the fingers. Here we go. I hope everyone is this it will be eating with it. With their fingers? Sometimes. With their hands? No. Look at this leaf. <laughs> Here's a leaf. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. You see what you're eating. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not chopped uh, kale. It's what it is. You're getting a whole leaf of kale with the chunks of bread. It's not really much secret, you know. I made my own little cannelloni, cannelloni of black raw kale, and then it goes. And there's a crouton hiding in the middle there, which I'm going to find. I'm so convinced now. This is addictive. You'll see it. Once you finish it, mm. tomorrow you want to be like, where is the kill? Mm. Well, Bring it's on the buco. So. <laughs> Came over. So, chef, it's never that I go into a Mediterranean <laughs> Italian restaurant and eat with my fingers, but um, I was very happy doing it here. Really? This, is a, this is a dish that has such beautiful power in its, in its flavors and how appropriate because the kale, raw kale, is texturally a very powerful thing and very, um, very sensuous, very, it, it engages you to get a little bit primitive, I think. Use the perfect words, primitive, intense food. Top 50 dishes in New York City, the uh, raw black kale salad at Il Buco. Gracias. You're very welcome. Estamos. Konnichiwa. Welcome to my kitchen. Now you have delicious miso in your freezer. So I will show you how to make wonderful healthy miso soup. That is miso shiru in Japanese. Today I'm going to use chicken and collard greens. My favorite combination. And first let's salt on both sides and then cook this on a heated skillet and adding the chicken skin side down like this oh did you hear the sizzling noise the chicken started to cook right away I didn't add any additional oil to the skillet because the skin of the chicken gives away proper amount of oil during the cooking so while cooking the chicken, here is your pot, medium sized pot. And this is for two person. And I have two cups kombu dashi, which is kelp stock. I have showed you how to make kombu dashi in the previous episode. If you forget it, I'll just check it out. And let's Put this kombu dashi over the stove top over medium heat. Uh, let's cut these colored greens. The early summer collard has very tender, a very small leaf and the tender leaf and the stem. So I always cook everything. So cut off just a little bit of stem and then slice everything thin. Uh, this is about 
three ounce now see this is wonderful golden color so the greens all goes into the kombu dashi while waiting for the chicken be cooked now here is your choice you can add akamiso red miso straight to your soup or saikyo miso sweet white miso i often combine these two together to produce more depth of flavor in my miso soup so here is the bowl and let's transfer these two miso in here and now chicken is almost ready so let me do, go to pick it up okay this is wonderful so let me slice this okay now uh, this is perfect colored greens in the pot is very very tender now so adding chicken and let's cook about 30 seconds or so while cooking the chicken let's transfer some broth into this miso bowl and you can just uh, stir and mix so that miso completely dissolves okay this is all smooth so the miso goes back to the pot and after adding the miso you don't overcook or now this is done so turn off the heat so i am going to divide this into two bowls wow look at this green color and the chicken this is the tori no miso shiru today i have my friend uh, the zak visiting my kitchen he always smells something delicious hi zak konnichiwa so uh, this is delicious tori no miso shiru and i would like to show you how to eat it in the japanese way okay and one rule is no spoon please okay so this is for you and this is mine and uh, let's have chopsticks and we always sip this soup just out of the bowl do you slurp uh no oh, this right one is. no slurping oh. not like noodles mm. Mm. wow this. Arigato. you can make this delicious miso shiru miso soup at any time in your kitchen. Jamata. See you later. Jamata. Putale. Bubble gum. It's the cheese sensation that's rocking the nation. Putale. Bubble gum. Molto parmigiano. Molto parmigiano. Putale. Bubble gum. Bubbles as big as Mario's belly Batali Batali Four kickin' flavors Parmesan Batali. Balsamic Blast Roasted Garlic And try new sugarless mortadella Batali Are you a cheese lover? Do you love cheese? Yeah, I love cheese. You love cheese? Yes. So are you a cheese lover? Now, are you a cheese lover? I am. Hello, I'm David Rosengarten. Welcome to Cheese 101. This is the blue cheese segment. Not everybody loves blue cheese, but when you get good blue cheese, it's really good stuff. I think maybe not everybody loves blue cheese because for many people, this is what blue cheese is. It's this white stuff in the bottle that you put on your salad. Ew. It's 
really terrible. <laughs> Not that. If that's your experience with blue cheese, I recommend that you taste the real blue cheese. I've got here the bluest of blue cheeses. I've got really some of the greatest blue cheeses of the world that I want to show you. Most blue cheese everywhere is made by chemical laboratories create this mold, which is technically called Penicillium Roqueforti. And then cheesemakers either mix it in with the curd or they inject it into the curd. And that's how it happens. There's no great secret. It's not like there's a special mold in the special cave of Roquefort or anywhere else. It all depends which mold you buy from the laboratory. First of all, well, we're going to start with Roquefort. Because Roquefort is the one that is probably the best known. It's certainly the most expensive. Bah. This is the only one on the table that's made from sheep's milk. And you can see it's kind of an oily blue cheese. Um, it kind of gets very creamy and sort of melts in your mouth. It's got a beautiful, intense, tangy flavor. Um, very expensive these days. Another uh, French blue cheese made in the center of France is called Femme d'Ambert. And it's not as expensive as, uh, as Roquefort, but it's really, um, it's quite good. And you can see the, um, the type of veining that's in this one. This one, um, I, it's really very similar looking. Um, I know that it's just not quite as intense as in flavor as the Roquefort, but remember, it, it, it costs less. <laughs> now, another type of blue cheese entirely is made in Italy, where the famous cheese is the gorgonzola. And you can have all different kinds of gorgonzola. I today have put out one that's kind of um, sweet and creamy, gorgonzola um, uh, dolce, or some people call it crematificato, crematicato, something with cream in it. Um, going to cut into this guy. And this guy is really, whereas Roquefort is oily, um, Gorgonzola is creamy. There's, one, there's more countries that are important in blue cheese, but there's one more that's supremely important. Because the only competition that Roquefort has in the whole world for most famous blue cheese is this one. This is Stilton, which comes from England, of course, from Nottinghamshire. And um, Stilton, whereas the Roquefort is oily and the Gorgonzola is creamy, the Stilton is kind of relatively dry. It's aristocratic. And you can see that the paste um, is a different color. It's more yellow. And it's got kind of a dull blue. But it's got a very wonderful, it feels English to me. It feels like, yes, we're having a Stilton in port as opposed to eh, the Gorgonzola. I mean, it's a whole different kind of uh, quality to it. Interestingly, about 30 years ago, a cheese was invented called Shropshire Blue, made right near uh, Stilton. Um, this is it. They actually color it with some um, annatto or acciotti. Um, and so that's an artificial color. I mean, it's not, you know, it comes from a plant, but um, this one is even more, Stilton has this kind of reserve to it. This is a Stilton-like cheese in texture, but it's got more of an intensity to it. I love blue cheese. Does that have all the stuff you look for in blue? Oh, delicious. That'd be good on a nice salad. Some cranberry in there. I like Almonds. the way you think. You're a combiner. Yeah. You're a uniter, not a divider. How to make a shrimp compound butter. Shrimp, oil, garlic, white wine, softened butter, salt and pepper. First get your pan hot and lightly toast the garlic without letting it get brown. Next add your shrimp. Let them get a little bit of color and add enough one to cover the bottom of the pan. As each shrimp reaches proper doneness, it shouldn't take very long, a minute or two, pull them out of the pan. Once all the shrimp are out, turn up the heat and reduce the liquid by half. The shrimp and the wine have to cool down before they can be added to the butter, or else it'll break. So set it aside while you get the food processor ready. Once the shrimp are warm but not hot, Toss them in with the butter and puree away. Once it's smooth, adjust for seasoning. Pour it out on a parchment paper and pop it into the freezer. To serve, just cut a slice and lay it on your hot food.